Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and I don't know which one is mine. There it is. We're so glad you decided to make it part of your day. <laughs> also here is John Schnepp. Hey, what's going on? I was just watching the Amityville Horror, <laughs> The Awakening. Oh, hey. Man, is that trailer awesome. Oh, wait, we're going to talk about that later. I'll do Ken Navsock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. It's Monday. Glad to be here. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, you know, I always hate it when days have to start like this, but uh, some sad news to start off uh, today's show. Uh, Ashley, what is it? Adam West, best known as the Cape Crusader Batman on the classic 1960s series, has died at the age of 88. West rose to the top of pop culture after Batman debuted in January of 1966. West reached a new level of fame as well when he accepted an offer to voice the mayor of Quahog named Adam West on Seth MacFarlane's long-running Fox animated hit comedy Family Guy. West died Friday night in Los Angeles after a short battle with leukemia. We here at Collider Video offer our deepest condolences to his family, friends, and fans. You know, it's it, it is odd. It's really weird to me that when when Adam passed, seeing a lot of people on Twitter, like obviously a lot of people like uh, sending out their condolences and RIP. You know, the first Batman I ever saw, and blah blah blah. But it was really interesting too at the same time to realize how many people never knew Adam West as Batman. They knew him as Mayor West right. on um, <laughs> uh, on Family Guy, which is so. When I loved his bit parts as Mayor West on Family Guy, I thought it was terrific. You know. When you think about um, the Batman TV show that Adam West led, does it resemble anything? Does it have any resemblance to the modern day comic book films and comic properties? No, absolutely not. But it was the foundation. It's what got everything started. It became the template to which everything else that came after it adapted, modified, and built upon was that. And it's so funny that so many of us still have such fond memories of that. I mean, just recently they announced that uh, the the animated, what was the name of the animated film where they got Adam West back to do the uh, voice? Tales from the, of the Cape Crusaders. Tales, and they've got a second one coming out that still hasn't come out where it's Batman fighting Two-Face played by William Shatner. So we still have an Adam West Batman that's we, we've got coming for us. So. Yeah, so I mean, such, I mean, I mean, I grew up, I mean, obviously the, the Batman TV series was before my time, but I grew up watching the reruns every single day. I come home at lunch from school and watch the reruns of it. And it's, it kind of formed the foundation of what is now the huge comic book push of, of our age. And, uh, you know, he lived such a long, great life. And I'm so happy that when he died, he got to go while being prominent again, again once the, the family guy stuff again. Mm. He wasn't just some actor that we have to remind people who he was. He died while like prominent again, like doing what he loved, acting, performing, and entertaining for people. And a great life by Adam West, and he will certainly be missed. Your thoughts on the passing of Adam West? Uh, yeah, really sad to to hear this news uh, this weekend, and not just because he played like my formative Batman when I was a little kid. That's what I grew up watching. I didn't even know it was shot in color because my parents had a black and white TV, so I was just like <laughs> sitting glued to this TV every day. At, like it was on at four o'clock every day, and I remember religiously watching Batman and I loved it even for all of its goofiness as I got older then I wanted to see a darker more spooky and psychologically damaged Bruce Wayne and Batman but man nothing beats the fun uh come on chum like the Batman <laughs> of the 60s and Adam West was an incredible actor he had such a great career doing these one-offs and like little characters like he was in Pete and Pete he played Principal Schwinger in the adventures of Pete and Pete from Nickelodeon he was in an incredible Conan O'Brien pilot called Look Well which if you haven't seen it check it out it's on YouTube it's hilarious he had a great sense of humor I got a chance to meet him just as a fan I went up got his autograph as Batman he was a really nice guy super fantastic dude and I'm really sad that he's not with us anymore Ken. Yeah, same like you guys. This is kind of the Batman of my youth, whether or not I was uh, sit I didn't watch it as much. It was, in Canada, was it Le Batman? Was it the same thing? <laughs> Less Batman. Uh, I was a big Gilligan's Island and fan, oddly enough. Yeah, he's good. Uh, but I would see this, and it did set, kind of, like you said, set the template in a weird way. Even when like Keaton became Batman, it was like th there was some fun cheesiness in the Burton Batmans that tied to this, yeah. uh, which sometimes we do miss. I got a little, got a little, you know, holy rusted metal Batman by, by Batman and Robin was a little crazy, but this, this was Batman growing up, and I love when when iconic actors who 
you know, in the 60s or something, they don't just fade away, but then they kind of accept who they are to mm -hmm. society. And I think that's what the, what the Family Guy thing kind of became Adam West going, yeah, I'm Adam West. I'll have some fun being Adam West. And it turned into an entire second career. And I, 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 I loved it. And uh, hey, good full life and career. I got to add one thing. I, I found it very, I mean, fitting in a horrible way. But in the last, only in the last couple of years has Batman 66 really come back around. Like well, they, they released, released the, the movie. And they released it, the movie, the entire series on Blu-ray, an incredible box set. Just came out like a couple of years ago, which is incredible. Get it if you haven't. And then him and Burt Ward and some of the other surviving cast members have recently recently all gotten together and started touring. They were bickering for years and yeah, hating each yeah. other. And just in the last couple of years have been touring together and doing these great big signings. So it's it's cool to know that Batman 66 is is remembered for what it is. And a lot of people may not remember this. I remember this as a kid. Okay, so you remember when they remade Superman and a lot of people saying, we're complaining that, oh, you should have got Tom Welling to play Superman. It's like, no, nah, nah. but back when the Michael Keaton Batman got announced, there was a lot of people, I remember reading a lot of articles and a lot of people saying, well, why didn't you go get Adam West? I mean, so people were still remembering him fondly, and obviously the Michael Keaton route and changing the Batman right. was definitely the right move, but it's just remembered that a lot of people remember him that fondly, and he will be missed. All right, let's move on. What's the next topic of the day? The first teaser trailer for Marvel's Black Panther debuted during the NBA Finals game on Friday, revealing the very first look at the world of Wakanda and its king T'Challa, better known as Black Panther. Fruitvale Station and Creed director Ryan Coogler's version of Wakanda takes center stage in Marvel's new cinematic chapter, featuring Chadwick Boseman in the title role after his debut in Captain America Civil War. Michael B. Jordan, Lupita Nyong'o, Andy Serkis, Martin Freeman, Winston Duke, Angela Bassett, and Forrest Whitaker also star. Black Panther is scheduled to hit theaters on February 16, 2018. John, what do you think of the first look at Black Panther? Well, I'm. It, it's a very good trailer. I like it a lot. And I was so glad that it was a very good trailer because, man, that first poster was terrible. That post they put out where it was like, it looked like a animated cartoon painting picture and body and then somebody photoshopped just Chadwick Boseman's live action head on yeah. it. I was like, ugh. But then the trailer came out. It was great. And I, I, let me, the one thing that I did not like about the trailer I like the final shot in it where he crushes the hood of the car, does the backflip, lands. But man, when you watch that in HD, I mean, that that is clearly animated. I mean, it's clearly, and it looks animated. And But you know what? Movie's so wild, maybe they'll clean that up and that'll be fine. Other than that, I thought the trailer was sharp. It was great. I love the fact that it looks like Andy Serkis and Ulysses Claw is not just going to be, oh, look, here, Claw's still around. No, it looks like he's going to be a central figure. And this maybe not the central figure. That's going to be Michael B. Jordan. But that looked great. I love, like a few months ago, a bunch of us got to go to Marvel Studios, like a whole, a whole bunch of the press went down, and they showed us about five or ten minutes of footage of Black Panther. And one of the things that I, the main thing I walked away with was how awesome Wakanda is. It really feels like great, and I mean this in the best of ways, 80s sci-fi, like this, there's this super advanced culture with ancient elements of culture mixed into it and it just looks amazing I can't wait to see it but one of the things that really jumped out to me even with the old we already knew Michael B. Jordan was in the film when Michael B. Jordan comes on and he looks amazing pairing again with his director uh, Coogler who of course directed him in, in uh, Creed and Fruitvale Station it struck me that you know what um Marvel right now has probably the three most talented young black actors in the business today in Chadwick Boseman, uh, Anthony Mackie, and now Michael B. Jordan are all there in the MCU. And that's a, a really cool coup de talk. I thought it was a sharp trailer, not the best trailer of the year or whatever, for, but for a first trailer, gets you on board. I love the tone that it, that it feels like. It's a great trailer, so I'm really on board with it. What did you think, Ed? Yeah, I agree. This is a big win, John. Again, it's just a first look. We got that little taste. We got a lot of great visuals. The, the songs are great. Everything about it is good. What I look at it, again, it's no secret. I've talked about it so many times. I'm not a big superhero guy, so I look for little things. What's going to pull me into this movie? I love the VO that we got going of, you're a good man. And a good, it's tough for a good man to, to be, be king. king. Yeah. And I think that is the theme that is good. That is that is something I'm going to zero in on, like the spirituality of Doctor Strange. We got something here. We got to can 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 you rule? Can you tap into something deeper and darker to face the the challenges that are in front of you? And I think it all is put forth in this trailer. It's it's intriguing. And yeah, the Wakanda stuff looks great. Um, I, I hope I trust. It looks like Marvel just said, "Hey, Mr. Coogler, 
go ahead and make your movie. And, and I think that's what we're getting here. It, it, was just, it felt like, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like they added the eyebrows to the Black Panther Man. Not sure I'm big on that, but tiny little nitpick anyway. Anyway, you saw the trailer. What did sure. you think? I loved it, man. I thought it was, uh, it was you know, it kind of blew me away. I wasn't really even expecting them to show a full trailer. I thought it'd be like a shot of Black Panther running then coming this next yeah. year or something. <laughs> it said, we got that step into the spotlight. This whole complete badass, like, clips of everything. I agree with you. Wakanda looks like a, a, an insane Kirby fantasy land. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. so much fun. To, like, if you go back to the very first appearance of Black Panther, uh, Wakanda back then had that kind of, like, super high-tech, advanced civilization. I mean... So I can't wait to see the pol the politics involved. I mean, Claw is definitely going to be one of many villains all trying to take over and get that vibranium because vibranium is what Wakanda has, and that's the only place that you can get it. So that's why it's a very valuable and hidden city. Um, I thought everything was fantastic. Angela Bassett looked amazing. Oh, she looks awesome. I mean, we got yeah. little, little micro-nugget clips of, like, every single little character, like, oh, I want to see more, I want to see more. So it left me wanting more. I agree, the last shot of the little, you know, cartoon dude flipping around. I'm sure they'll add some blur and make it a little more realistic. It's like a Marvel first pass that we shouldn't have seen. They should have been like, just get that one <laughs> shot looking realistic or blur it or something. Like, do some kind of, I want to focus on the car so that the 3D dude isn't so crispy and looking like a video game. But even with that, I loved it. I think I probably watched it like 10 times. I was like, step into the spotlight. Woo! Like, jumping around. <laughs> like, oh my God, this movie's going to be amazing. So, really got me really amped up. And you, know, a lot of, you see a lot of people commenting too that, you know, the, the female guards that he has, oh, the, the shades of wars, they didn't put the best parts in the trailer because we saw some stuff. You're going to see them in some action and it looks amazing. Let me add to what Ken said. I thought that the setup of introducing the Black <laughs> Panther in the last Captain America Civil War was perfect because what yeah. they did is they set him up with, with, you know, spoilers. If you haven't seen Civil War, you might as well put those spoilers up for those people who probably didn't see Civil War. I know there's about a thousand of you. Um, where his father dies and he yeah. has to take on the mantle. It's also like you have to have that responsibility now that you're king and also revenge and murder is not part of that. And that's why I like that, you know, he kind of cut through that entire movie and you he really established who T'Challa is in that film. So I'm looking forward to them continuing that story, both going forward and backward. It looks like we're going to get a really cool set of flashbacks as well. Yeah. So I'm excited. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? According to a report from Variety, Annapurna Pictures has found distribution through MGM and will release the reboot of Death Wish starring Bruce Willis for a prime holiday November 22nd launch. Hostile director Eli Roth helms the movie, which is based on the movie and Brian Garfield novel about vigilante Paul Kersey, who goes after criminals when his wife is murdered and his daughter is left catatonic after being sexually assaulted during a home invasion. The movie also stars Vincent D'Onofrio, Kimberly Elise, Mike Epps, and Elizabeth Shue. Schnepp, thoughts on the re reboot of Death Wish getting a Thanksgiving release? Well, you know... Hey, when I when I'm cutting into those uh, you know Thanksgiving delicious uh, sandwiches and meats and current you know I don't even eat meat anymore. Uh, yeah, Death Wish. What's going on? So you know all I can say is you know Sylvester Stallone was attached to this for like a microsecond where he's going to write, direct, and be the character, and then that kind of like got absorbed by Eli Roth. I want to do this, and then Bruce Willis came on board, and I was like, as long as it's the bald Bruce Willis, I don't know. I don't really know what to think about this. So I mean, you know, have you ever seen the original Charles Bronson Death Wish? Watch that. Oh yeah, definitely watch that. You might be you, you might be okay to skip the seventy two sequels that came, but uh, I mean, or any of the sequels. The third one is the best with a weird like <laughs> I'm a punk rocker. It's so it's actually <laughs> so insane. It's worth seeing Death Wish three. So let me. I guess so. If you think about, I all honestly, I also don't know how to feel about this because, look, on the one hand, if you say, okay, hey, you're gonna do a Death Wish remake, who would be an ideal guy to play that role right now? Bruce Willis is certainly one of those guys. I can't remember the last time. I mean. The upcoming movie that I want to see Bruce Willis and that I'm looking forward to is Glass. I mean, that's, right. I'm kind of, when it comes to Bruce Willis, I'm kind of got a very narrow focus right now. I'm just looking forward to Glass. But this is interesting. This could look, and everybody loves a good revenge story. Like, when, I think that's one of the reasons why John Wick, the first one, works so well. Yes, the action is incredible, the choreography is great, but it all is based on that primal feeling like, you killed that puppy. You gotta yeah. die. I mean, and it's that that core of it that just gets you emotionally invested immediately as mm -hmm. an audience. And if it sounds like the setup could be there for that, if you can completely get a sympathetic with the Bruce Willis character right now and just feel like I can't sleep tonight until I see Bruce Willis kill those guys, <laughs> That's right. then this movie can work. <laughs> it does feel a little bit out of date, maybe, but yeah. but maybe it could work. I don't know. What do you think, Ken? 
<laughs> Does it fill out a date? There's a scene in Death Wish 1 or 2, I don't know. Uh, check it out where uh, Charles Bronson has a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> and he shoots it at a dude, and the dude explodes. That's not Death Wish 1. That's that, when it gets comic that's when creepy, it gets yeah. crazy. Uh, so can they update that for these trouble in modern times during this Thanksgiving weekend? I don't know, John. I don't know. It's interesting. Eli Roth kind of might be a perfect fit, fit for this. It could be... I can't see it being campy like the sequels. It'd have to go to the more the original style. Uh, Charles Bronson is... Is an interesting uh, case study too, of just like uh, that kind of act. I'd like to have his career of just. Uh, <laughs> um, and get paid but hey, for that. put a mustache on Bruce Willis. You got it. You're so right. It ties into John Wick. Taken. Uh, you're immediately gonna get. Uh, you know, this is some serious stuff his family's gone through here. So, uh, can they make that fun? I don't know. Do they need to make it fun? Is it is it gritty? I don't know. How do you want your death wish, John? Gritty or fun? Gritty. It's like, you know, they got the right guy to do some torture porn, uh, you know, like have the, his daughter tortured in some yeah. horrible way exactly. so that you want to see Bruce Willis murder all these dudes slowly. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, if he's walking around doing like Clint Eastwood lines from Dirty Harry, I'm out. I'm going to get yeah. up and walk, walk out, out of the theater if that happens because that's not what the original death wish was. So I kind of trust Eli Roth to take... The, the vibe of the very first Death Wish and return to that. Yeah. I mean, he's a good horror director and he gets the different genres, so I don't think he's going to mix and match and make like a, hey, I've got a whole bunch of cool like one-liners because I'm Bruce Willis, yippee ki -yay. It's not that movie, and if it's right. that movie, I'm not even going to go see it. Right. If you, I could accept a little bit of mixing a little bit of that in with it if they get the rest of the tone right. Like I, I read once there was an early version of the script, which I don't think is there anymore, but where there was a scene where Willis catches one of the guys, well, the character catches one of the guys, and he has him tied up to a chair, and there's a prolonged scene where he takes pliers and then slowly peels off the guy's fingernail it's like I just thinking about that like you you but you have a tone like that you can be forgiving for dropping the odd line in there to try to let the audience relieve a little bit of built up stress and anxiety sometimes there's a place for that but I, I agree with you they make that the tone of it like them like him dropping one-liners yeah. it probably won't work all right what's next it's Monday, which means it's time for the box office report. Pulling in an estimated 57 million, Warner Brothers and DC Comics release of Wonder Woman finishing the number one spot for the second weekend in a row at the box office. The movie dropped only 45% in its sophomore session, pulling in more than 205 million after just 10 days in release. The Mummy reboot starring Tom Cruise opened below expectations, taking the number two spot with an estimated 32.2 million. DreamWorks Captain Underpants pulled in an estimated 12. $1.3 million for the number three spot, while Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales finished in the number four spot with an estimated $10.7 million. Rounding out the top five is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which brought in an estimated $6.2 million as its domestic total now tops $365 million. Ken, thoughts on the weekend box office numbers? Hey, congratulations to Wonder Woman for still retaining this audience, and that's big. I was one of the people who saw it this weekend because I couldn't see it last weekend, and it was a packed theater, and I enjoyed it. I think this movie earns everything that it's uh, it's getting. It's it's kind of a movement picture. There's people uh, really wanting to see this, not just for what it is, but for what it represents, and I think that's great, and congratulations to Patty Jenkins and that team. It's uh, the, the Mummy thing's interesting because... It, it looks like, you know, uh, the domestic numbers, you might be like, hmm, Tom, but Tom Cruise scores big worldwide, and this is his biggest opening since War of the Worlds. Yeah. So Tom Cruise is still a movie star in this galaxy. Um, and uh, the rest of the stuff, I mean, I don't know. Poor pirates. <laughs> Poor pirates. I, look, first of all, we should me mention, like, coming in at number five, in its sixth week of release, still in there, yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy, topped over $825 million worldwide mm. so far. I mean, so not bad. That's yeah. pretty damn good. The Mummy. Mm. I mean, what, what can you say? Look, yeah, the worldwide numbers are solid. Absolutely, they're solid. I think right now, worldwide, it's it's clocked in like $170-plus million. Yeah. The film is going to end up being profitable and make money for the company. That's good. The bad side, though, is that there's often a tail effect with the domestic box offices when it goes worldwide. When something's really huge domestically and it kicks off huge domestically and kind of weak internationally, if you, once you get into the sequels, the international numbers then pick up. However, when you get domestic numbers that 
trash that are just bad that eventually that catches up to them too eventually and if they've got this new franchise that could hurt i am one of the 17 percent of critics who actually thought the good of the mummy outweighed the bad the third act was terrible they dropped the ball on a lot of things this movie isn't as good as it should have been i still thought it was worth seeing i, I still got a kick out of it and enjoyed it to a degree but i mean there's no there's no sugarcoating this a 32 million dollar opening weekend for this film is not what Universal wanted. Yes, it's, you know, they're placating themselves a little bit because of the international numbers, that's great. But I guarantee you nobody at Universal is happy right now with these numbers. They have to pick it up and hopefully they'll learn from their mistakes and go in that direction. Wonder Woman, I think I said when we were talking about it, I said I think I saw it making 40 to a 47% drop, fell right in there exactly where it should be, $57 million on its second weekend. Worldwide right now, uh, Wonder Woman after its second weekend is around the 400 to 450, I think $435 million range uh, worldwide, which I think is solid, that's good. And uh, everything's going the way it should be for it right now. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm one of those people who's affected by all the negative reviews of The Mummy because I was looking forward to seeing it. I still am planning on seeing it, but guess what? I didn't see it this weekend, and why? Because everybody was, said it just wasn't as good as they thought it would be. So that made me kind of tempered when I had an already busy, stacked weekend, and I had that, like, two- or three-hour window where I was, oh, I might jump off and go see The Mummy, or I'll just sit here and read this book. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm looking forward to seeing The Mummy. I still want to see it. I'm happy to hear that internationally it did well. And this doesn't necessarily bode, you know, the death knell of the dark universe or whatever. They're still going to make The Bride of Frankenstein. They've got an incredibly talented director, Bill Condon. Yeah. And he's going to take that a to... a very good cast. Incredible soaring heights. Like, so you can't just... Just because The Mummy didn't do it, you know, for a lot of people, doesn't mean that all these other horror movies are not going to. So I think... It's the lead-off hitter. Yeah, it's the, it's the first of. So we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, Wonder Woman, I'm, I'm very happy that it's continuing its its run. It deserves it. Um, I also thought it wasn't going to have a big drop. I'm very happy to see that it didn't. Um, looking forward to uh, Wonder Woman 2. Looking forward to Patty Jenkins possibly directing Superman. That's what I'm hearing, so... All right, folks, we've reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? A new trailer for Pixar's Cars 3 has landed online ahead of the film's release next weekend. The third entry in the Pixar franchise focuses on an aging Lightning McQueen as he attempts to stay competitive in a racing world populated by modern, super-fast cars. The voice cast includes Owen Wilson, Cristela Alonso, Chris Cooper, Nathan Fillion, Larry the Cable Guy, Army Hammer, Bonnie Hunt, Johnny Ratzenberger, and Cheech Marin. Cars 3 races into theaters this Friday on June 6th. 16th, John Byers on the new trailer for Cars 3. I gotta sell. I gotta sell. Um, look, I, I'm a huge Pixar fan. Huge Pixar fan. But I, I gotta be honest, I, nothing so far has gotten me excited about this, including Cars 1 and Cars 2 have not gotten me mm. excited about this. And the marketing has not done anything to really get me there either. The synopsis of the story makes it sound like this could potentially be the best of the Cars franchise, and I hope that it is. Now, granted, I also didn't think the, the trailers and the premise and anything for Up sounded very good. And then that went out the window five right. minutes into the movie. I was totally on board with it. But yeah, so far, nothing about Cars 3 has got me interested. So it's going to do bonkers box office this weekend, I've no doubt. But so far, the marketing hasn't, isn't going to make me one of those people lining up for the first one. Even though I'm seeing the movie tonight, and maybe my tone will change after I see it. But so far, nothing works for me. Yeah, you put cars in a title on a video, and people flock to it. Yeah. People love this movie. I, I, so I'm going to sell the trailer because it doesn't, it doesn't go to me. I mean, I like the Eagles. I'll, I'll sing along to that. All right. <laughs> me, uh, you know, but um, but I, I realize, I think we all realize this isn't for us. It doesn't mean uh, it, it's going to be bad. Those numbers are great. Uh, and Radiator Springs at, 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 at California Adventure is one of my favorite rides. So I guess cars it's works. great. Great. And I'll tell you what you do. You go single rider. You skip past the 90-minute line. 20 minutes. You're good. Just ride. Break up a date. You'll sit there. Third wheel in the cars ride. Um, so I'll sell this overall, but I think a lot of people are going to buy it, John. Schnepp? Yeah, I'm totally selling this. I haven't seen Cars 1 or 2, so why why would I go see Cars 3, especially with this, like, rip-off of Rocky trailer? Oh, you're going to have the old guy training. He's going. He's training along the beach. It's rated G. It's for children. I'm out. 
<laughs> All right, what's next? <laughs> Annapurna Pictures has released the first TV spot for their upcoming Detroit. From Academy Award winning director Catherine Bigelow, Detroit tells the gripping story of one of the most terrifying moments during the civil unrest that rocked Detroit in the summer of 1967. The film stars an ensemble cast made up of John Boyega, Will Poulter, Algie Smith, Jack Rayner, John Krasinski, and Anthony Mac Mackey. It will be released on August 4th to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the riots. Jeanette, buy yourself the new TV spot for Detroit. Oh, I'm buying it. This looks fantastic. I mean, it looks like a very tense, uh, a frightening uh, biopic, but, but I don't know whose biopic it is. All the people who are involved kind of biopic. It's like a, 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 like a slice of life of what it must have been like to be in Detroit at that period of time, uh, especially the cast. I mean, everyone from John Boyega all the way down to uh, Poulter. I mean, all yeah, of them. Yeah, Poulter's great. Just they look fantastic, so I can't wait to see this. It's a big buy. Oddly enough, I'm going to sell it. I, I can't wait for this movie where you're talking about Catherine Bigelow as the director, the cast, Boyega, Anthony Mackie, Poulter, John Kaczynski, all the way down. I have very, very little doubt this movie is going to be amazing. I can't wait to see it. The trailer itself, though, didn't do anything to get me more excited for it. And I really do wonder about the, the, the philosophy of making a very cut TV spot as your first you know, introduction to the general audience mm. about this movie that's coming. I don't think that's the right place for it, and I think they bit them a little bit here. Again, no doubt that this movie's going to be awesome, and I can't wait to see it, but the trailer didn't get me any more excited to see it. What do you think? I'm going to buy it only because I was very aware of what this movie was and is as, as a student of history. This is a, this is a dark, uh, dark time, summer 67, ties into baseball history. I'm a baseball guy, so the Detroit Tigers were in the World Series. It's the Cardinals. This, this was, this, there's a lot of history to this that I'm aware of. So when I see this, I buy it because I'm like, oh, I'm so looking forward to this. This is a, a very probably important movie that even 50 years after is still very re relevant yeah. today. So there's a lot of that. But I do agree with what you're saying, John. If, you just, if you're younger and you aren't fully aware, you might not know just based on this TV sh TV spot, but I'll buy it for what it is overall. All right, guys, we're doing this show live, and when we do live shows, we like to save a little bit of time at the end to take your live Twitter questions. How do you get a Twitter question on? It's simple. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Fire him some questions on Twitter, and Wendy will pick a couple out near the end of the show. Now, I also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. A little bit later today, a brand new episode of Collider TV Talk. You're going to want to make sure you tune in and watch that. On Friday, a brand new movie trivia showdown match aired with Rachel Cushing, your partner. That's right. And Nick Scarpino, make sure you go and watch that as well. Over the weekend, we dropped two new episodes of Collider Mailbag. Uh, Wendy Lee Zaney is actually on those mailbags with us this weekend. And, of course, a new episode of Collider Behind the Scenes and Bloopers. And, of course, every Friday on the Verizon Go 90 Network, a brand new episode of Jeremy Johns and his show, Awesome Tacular. Make sure you check that out. All right, now before we get to the mailbag questions, or I should say the Twitter questions, let's go to the mailbag. Ashley, what do we got? Andy writes, hey Collider, so I'm a horror fan for both mainstream and stupid horror movies. Case in point, Amityville Horror The Awakening. I remember seeing the trailer for it a while ago and thought it could be fun in theaters, and then Weinstein Company pulled it from its release schedule for the third time and haven't dated it since. Is this because the movie is really, really bad, or are there other reasons? Well, I mean... Not, you know, I don't spend my afternoons in the halls of the Weinstein Company, so I can't speak too authoritative. Look, can't say this. It was supposed to come out last year, and then I, th I think it was supposed to come out this April, and right. then they push it to like June, and then it got pushed off again. It could be one of two reasons. One, the movie's really bad. That's one potential reason, but that's not necessarily the reason. It could also be a case of the studio just looking at it and saying, we don't see how this could make money. Or we don't see if we put in the money to distribute and market, because marketing right. is quite often, like depending on how big the film is, marketing can be more expensive than the production of the films themselves. So they could just be sitting back and saying, look, maybe the movie's pretty good, but the way it is, we don't see it attracting an audience. We don't see if we put 25 million more dollars into putting this in theaters and getting the marketing out and all that kind of stuff that will even recoup that 25 million dollars so it could be a combination of the two maybe hey it's bad and we don't see how it could so there's a lot of different uh potential reasons it's not always necessarily because it's that bad although you'd be forgiven if that's the first thing that comes to your mind ken what do you think is happening here 
First of all, can I swipe right on this picture, John? Just the one behind you? Just, just it looks interesting. <laughs> oh, um, I, I, you're, you're spewing knowledge that I wouldn't even possibly know because I'm scared just looking at that. Um, but yeah, that's, you're so right. You talk, touch upon the marketing. There's all those things about this business of making movies that th- sometimes gets movies uh, you know, on the shelf. Um, it was starring Bella Thorne, too. This is my thing where like four years from now, they release her and like, hey, she was in this. We got Bella Thorne because she's mm-hmm. super big now. That happens, too, as well. But yeah, the, the marketing, uh, that takes a lot of money to market movies to make money back make your money back yeah i mean uh you know i watched the trailer right before we started because i was like i thought i I vaguely remember seeing this two years ago and it was like yeah yeah, i did it stars a you know uh, the guy from gotham who plays the neo pseudo joker jerome i can't remember that actor's name he's in it jennifer jason lee is in it she's a fantastic actress it's directed by this guy who uh did uh p2 and he did the remake of maniac so he's done a few different uh kind of you know, thriller, horror films. Um, the trailer it doesn't do anything for me. It feels like perhaps it's, you know, a very, you know, one room or two room type of a movie where you're like, we've set it up, you're in this film, you know, now you're not gonna leave this these two sets or something. It, that's kind of, kind of how it feels to me. I have no idea if it's good or bad, but it seems like that they're not, that they're not finding a way to release it. Even just putting it on VOD right. uh, means, you know, bad stuff. So. <laughs> you know, there is also another situation here, although this is very rare, but remember that movie Red Dawn, the remake of Red yeah, Dawn yeah, that yeah. came out? They had made that film years before it acted, before it finally came out, but they just kept it on the shelf, and they kept it on the shelf, and then they had this star in the film, this guy that a lot, a lot of people had heard about, called Chris Hemsworth. Then all of a sudden he was Thor, they waited for the Thor and the Blu-ray, and then they put out things starring Chris Hemsworth. So it, it also could be a matter of them like reassessing their strategy about we think there might be a better time. Ah, oh, we've got these like maybe we've got a couple of these cast members and they're scheduled to come out in this other movie that should be a hit 18 months from now. Let's just keep it on the shelf. Right. And I mean, could be lots of different reasons, so you never know. All right, guys, I said we'd save a few minutes to go to your live Twitter questions, and we're gonna do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? This one comes from Hakeem Ray, who writes, since the, mon- the mummy has gotten mediocre reviews and not that much money, could that mean Luke Evans return his role as Dracula? Okay, first of all, saying it got mediocre reviews is very <laughs> generous. Uh, <laughs> it's got a 17% right now. I wouldn't call that mediocre. I'd say that sub-mediocre and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it, I mean, look, and again, if you take the worldwide numbers into account, it's not doing too terribly badly right now. But... They're never going to go back to that Luke Evans Dracula. They're never, never, ever, ever going to go. I love Luke Evans. I think he's one of the most underrated performers in the business today. I think he's terrific. But that movie did not work. And they're not going to go back to it. And they're not even going to acknowledge its existence. So I, I can't see it happening. What do you think? No, uh, absolutely not. I don't think Dracula Untold made $30 million on its opening weekend. Yeah. I mean, I think it made a lot less. So... But I'm not sure. You can fact check that. But uh, yeah, they've already said they've distanced themselves from that, even though they added a little end sequence that took place in the modern times with Charles Dance kind of skimping around in a business suit. They were like, that doesn't matter. This isn't part of our shared universe. Who knows? But they're not going to go back to that Dracula. I mean, Charles Dance uh, skipping around a business suit is uh, <laughs> well, my life aesthetic. <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah, go forward. They're going forward. They got this dark universe all planned out. They'll get it going from there. All right, what's next? The Gray Jedi 28 writes, would the rush to make a John Wick 3 with Sulsky actually make the Highlander reboot happen? Yeah, because as of right now, um, Stahelski, I don't think he's committed directing John Wick 3 because he's got this Highlander project that he's really passionate about. So look, and this Highlander reboot is something they've been trying to get going for at least six or seven years. I mean, for a long time, yeah. Ryan Reynolds was signed on, and I love Ryan Reynolds. Everybody knows, good Canadian kid, I love me some Ryan Reynolds. I didn't quite think he was the Highlander. I didn't think he was a McLeod. I mean, I just didn't see that, but I would have been on board if they tried it. Um, But it looks like they're rounding the bases here. I think this thing's gonna happen, and that's the reason why I don't think is actually going to end up directing John Wick 3 is because of the Highlander. So I think we're safe there. You guys have any thoughts? No, no, but I think, yeah, he, what he calls himself, the prep director, which we've determined is yes. the fluffer of directing, so we got that. <laughs> uh, and what, what Canadians don't you claim? Do you, is there any Canadians you back off of? Uh, every once in a while, Justin Bieber. Oh, okay. uh, lately, Dan Aykroyd. 
Yeah, uh, but that's only lately. I'm no, sure yeah. I'll get yeah, back okay. on board with that. It's good to claim is I like to claim as many Canadians as I can. I'm not even Canadian. Uh, <laughs> I am immortal. That's all I have to say about I that. Have in me the fun of kings. Okay, what's next? <laughs> all right, this one comes from. I'm gonna butcher his name. I'm gonna try. Uh, Joa or Hoa Paolo, who writes. I just want to ask if there's a chance that we get a teaser trailer of Infinity War at D23 or Comic Con. You know, here's what I think they will do. When uh, D23 were at two years ago, they, uh, Doctor Strange was in production, but they were not ready to show anything. So what they did instead, which they did something very cool. They showed us a kind of trailer presentation made up of concept art and storyboards, and they showed us that. So I don't think they're going to be ready or want to be ready to show us like footage per se, I, I could be absolutely wrong about this. I mean, I hope they do, but I wouldn't be surprised if they just if they did uh, that same kind of Doctor Strange presentation where they showed it to us with, with uh, storyboards and concept art. So I don't know. What do you think? Boy, I think they're going to show something because D twenty three is literally one week before San Diego Comic Con, and with them trying to kind of make a little bit more of a separation. I mean, Marvel's still going to have a presence at San Diego Comic Con. They're still going to have their big Hall H presentation, and you know they're going to drop some flavor. Big Thor Ragnarok. They're going to drop some Black they're Panther. They're heavy Thor Ragnarok. And they are going to definitely drop some Infinity War stuff. I guarantee you. So why wouldn't they drop something the week before at their very own convention, which they're trying to brand as like, hey, if you want that Star Wars or that Marvel flavor, or like the you know the Disney cartoon flavor, that's where you're going to get the biggest and best you know representation because that's their brand. So I would see it as kind of a, a silly thing for them to not. Uh, promote their own brand the week before they're going to something that is not their brand. And but I think that I'm really happy to see that they're still sharing uh, with you know San Diego Comic Con. But I I definitely think they're going to drop something big at D23. Yeah, it's uh, this D23 San Diego little war that's kind of brewing and it's kind of interesting. I think if, you're right, John. If it's just kind of like we got pictures, they might highlight it at D23 and it's a part of Hall H. Uh, at at Comic Con, but if they've got something, they actually got something concrete. Maybe maybe, maybe they geared towards San Diego this year. I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I like those little concept drawings. Sometimes it's weird. It's like yeah. it's like not Tony Stark, but it's Tony Stark drinking or something like that. But yeah, this 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 separating from Comic Con and putting it so close is going to be interesting this year. What they're going to show and what they might not, uh, what they keep for themselves. It's going to be interesting. So you raised a couple things about, uh, which is why I don't think they're going to go too heavy on uh, the next Avengers, is the fact that they do have Thor Ragnarok, and they do have Black Panther, and mm -hmm. they do have, they're going to want to put all the attention and focus, I think at any rate, from a strategic point of view, they're going to want to put all the attention on those films, because they're coming out. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Ant-Man and the Wasp. That's, all, that's already, I, I don't even think they wrapped production on that. If, they, yeah. if they're shooting now or they might have already wrapped. But I just think, you know, like last year's uh, San Diego Comic-Con, they showed tons of stuff for yeah. every, they showed Thor Ragnarok last year. Yeah. Like incredible yeah. clips from that. Like yeah. that, then we saw some of that in the, tr the the short teaser trailer that we finally got for Thor Ragnarok. So I would be so, I would be really surprised if we didn't get at least one minute of Avengers yeah. Infinity War where all, we all lose our minds. So. All right, what's next? This one comes from J.C. Alexander, who writes, Empire reports Melissa McCarthy is to play Margie Claus. Question, is this the apocalypse? <laughs> Mar uh, Margie Claus. I guess that's supposed to be Mrs. Claus. Oh, right. Um, that sounds to me like a perfect... Tropic Thunder fake trailer. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that, that's what it sounds yeah. like. Booty a, sweat. <laughs> yeah, right yeah. alongside booty sweat would be <laughs> Margie. Um, I, I don't know. That that doesn't. I, I, I really like Miss Melissa McCarthy. Mm. I really enjoyed Spy. I love her in Bridesmaids. I like her in a lot of stuff. I don't, I don't think this is a wise move. Is this I, the same movie that has like uh, Natalie Portman playing Santa Claus's daughter, and she's like Santa Claus sick? He's got. Botulism. I thought you were going to say her si his side mistress. No, well, Santa that, Claus's I side would, mistress. Might see that movie. That, that's um, interesting. <laughs> but uh, no, wasn't there some other movie, like some other insanely dumb movie, like Santa's sick, or I can't remember what it was called. But like, Nat sick. Natalie Portman's playing the daughter, and she's. Am yeah, I, I think it's separate. I remember us reporting on that a while ago, where like Natalie Portman plays like the daughter, and yeah. she's only taking. Or no, it was Anna Kendrick. Anna Kendrick. I'm Whoa, not making this shit it? up. No, I remember because I got angry. I was like, this is so dumb. But honestly, Melissa McCarthy as a, 
Margie Clizzard. What is that? San what is Santa's wife's name? Is it Margie? It's now Margie. I guess Come it on. is Margie. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't get that mad at that. You know, she's funny. So. I no, I'm looking at it now. Look, there's a lot of people uh, I know from my old Groundlings days here. Damon Jones, who's co-writing it. Ben Falcone, who's Melissa's husband. Right. I, I trust these people. They've yeah. got a comedy pedigree. Uh, I, I think Melissa's very funny. It could be one of those kind of big, bold, giant comedies that works or, or a funny kind of uh, zero-in uh, yeah. uh, Margie Claus just knocking elves over. Yeah. <laughs> get, get that toy made. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's next? <laughs> All right, this one comes from Crimson Shorts, who writes, What are your thoughts of John Boyega being cast if they reboot the Blade franchise? Um, Sure. I mean, you, you know my usual thing is, like, put any good, talented actor in there, and I'm okay with it. It all depends on the, the script and the directing of it. But, yeah, John Boyega is definitely a solid, great actor. If they announced they would do that, I'd, sure, I'd be okay with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, he's a great actor. Sometimes it gets to that, like, where you're like, aren't there other actors on the planet? Where it's like, they're always like, whoever's the most popular actor is then in, like, 40 different franchises, which gets... Like, Jeremy Renner was in everything at one point. He was Hawkeye. He was, like, Jason Bourne's brother in Legacy, whatever, some cousin. Yeah. And he was Mission Impossible. Mission is Impossible. It? I was like, yo. I was like, I, you know, I, and I, he's an awesome actor. So I feel like... Like you know, Hansel and Gretel. That's yeah, Hansel and Gretel. I mean, who <laughs> could forget I mean, that? Right, right. Um, so I mean, I love John Boyega. I would love to see him as as a, as Blade, but he's also he's you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, who who played Blade? What, was it Two Chains? It was a no. It's Sticky Fingers. Sticky Fingers. That's who it was. Yeah, that's and right. he was great. You know, I actually. I didn't mind that TV series. Sticky Fingers was, is a really good actor. Kirk Jones is real name. I've worked with him. He's a, he's a fantastic dude. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a good casting call for a different kind of Blade. So, um, you know, yeah, and John Boyega is a great actor, so I can't get <laughs> mad at it. I would, I would actually I'd be like, cool, cool decision, but there's so many different, like, seeing Chadwick Boseman play Black Panther is refreshing. Yeah. And it's like, that's what I mean. I, I want to see those kinds of casting decisions. Yeah, I, look, I love John Boyega. I will follow him to the ends of the earth. So this, if he wants to do this, this works out. If that's something that's true, I, I'm all on board. But I'll tell you, who have something to say about it. Wesley Snipes is probably <laughs> not done playing Blade, Ooh. and you're going to have to keep him off the lot. I think he's playing Blade right now. <laughs> it's just at breakfast, he plays Blade. <laughs> all right, one more question. Okay, this one comes from Matthew Chantra, who writes, uh, other than I am your father, what is your favorite reveal or surprise in any movie? Thanks, guys, coming from Toronto. Whew. Well, I mean, there's, there's a couple of big ones. Obviously, Sixth Sense. <laughs> Uh, Rosebud is one of the, the great ones of all time. To me, though, it's uh, I would go with Usual Suspects and mm. Kaiser Soze. I would go with that one. I'm not going to go into the details of what that means in case you haven't seen it. And if you have not seen Usual Suspects, watch it immediately. Mm. Um, yeah, so I'll go with that one. What about you guys? Oh, man. Big, big, favorite big reveal? Uh, well... I go with the slow burns, like, you know, I guess you won't live, but then again, who does? You know, it makes you have to think about the ending. You're like, oh, shit, it's... And then credits, so... Right. Uh, you know, I'm not a big, you know... Oh, the, that's who it was. The clue ending. Get multiple choice, you know? <laughs> what about you? <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm bad at this too, even though I have seen a lot of movies with big reveals. Uh, the Vader one, it's, I mean, obviously it's high in my life there, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'll tell you what, I still was like, wait, the village is in modern times? <laughs> wait a minute, what? <laughs> hey, I got one for you. Chinatown. Wait till oh, that ends. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a very grim ending. All right, guys, so that'll do it for this installment of the Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me, starting right here with Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter or, uh, what is it? Oh, that's right, Instagram, just <laughs> at John Schnepp. Hey, it's the last week of trying to get my crazy, weird poetry book published. Go to Kickstarter. It's called Isolated Mutations of the Assembly Line Baby. We are almost there. Pitch in, help me get this weirdo book published, and check into Heroes tomorrow. Right beside me, Mr. Ken Napsock. Wow, I mean, that sounds intriguing, John. I, I can't <laughs> wait to get this uh, supported myself. Uh, you can follow me at Ken Napsock across all social media platforms and on the app Anchor at Daily Thrones. Right over there, we got Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And, of course, Wendy Lee. The Movie Couple channel on YouTube, at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And, of course, catch her on the mailbag episodes that went up this weekend. You guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter and YouTube simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.